say is, uh, as an engineer, my career has been defined by floods and droughts. And so, uh, you know, I bring that perspective of, when you mentioned the magic number, it's almost four decades now in terms of, of, uh, of experience since I graduated in the, in the 1970s. So you do begin to see the cycles, and uh, I guess, Director, you made a comment about uh, 2006, and we've forgotten. That's what we've always found, right, is that, is that uh, the teachable moments are so brief. And, and I guess the, the, the difference between now and, and perhaps earlier in my career is that just now people seem to be paying a bit of attention, <laughs> which they weren't before because, you know, we have a drought, we have a flood, you do a report, go to the shelf until next time, and then nothing happens, right? <laughs> anyway, so in terms of, of um, why I'm here today, I'd like to ask a question of the group. How many of you are actually familiar with or heard of Living Water Smart? So, a third of, third of the audience, I okay, guess it's good, because I mean, that, it's, it's a very visionary document. You know, it's, it's very non-governmental in terms of how it was written, but it, it does give us a vision of where we need to go. And uh, so part of my role then is really is on the implementation side. I'm an on-the-ground guy, and um, my world is the world of open government. You know, we're, 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 we're the rubber hits the road, so to speak, in this world of action. So that's the perspective I'm going to give you in terms of talking about collaboration and design with nature and how we adapt to floods and droughts, which is really what defines uh, climate change for us. So. In terms of you know what, what I do and the people I'm associated with, the question we always ask people is, well, the way we pose the challenge is, what do we want this place to look like in 50 years? Because if you can create a picture of where you want to get to, then you can get there. And I just want to tell you a story because about three years ago, I met uh, a fellow named Jamie Swanson of the Cowichan Tribes on Vancouver Island. And uh, we were doing a showcasing innovation series over there. And Jamie said to me, well, you know, to get the big picture, you start with smallest pieces. And I said, come again, Jamie? What do you mean by that? And he explained, he said, in terms of protecting the, the couch and river, he said it starts with the foundation grain around the band office. And he said, come on outside, I'll show you. Now, of course, he really couldn't show you because he was talking about foundation grain, which was buried, right? But the point was, he was really keen about the standard he developed of how to infiltrate the water around that building, he said, because it starts right here, Kim, because how we manage the water at our band office has a direct correlation with the health of the couch and river. So it always stuck in my mind. To get to the big picture, you start with the smallest pieces. Now, sort of bringing more to a techie, techie level, in terms of dealing with uncertainty, this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with, with, with uncertainty and we're managing risk. That's the essence of, of what people like myself do in, in, our, in our careers, because there's no definite answers. So we build resiliency incrementally. So what that means is a lot of little things that we need to be doing, and that's where we're going to be going with this conversation. Because you know, it starts with something simple, like soil, and last week, we released what we call the topsoil primer set, long policy and technical, really the distillation of the experience of three leading municipalities in this province, Surrey, North Van District, and the city of Courtney on the island. Because we say in terms of uh, making fundamental changes that it gets towards water sustainability, if we can't get the soil depth issue right, then it'll be very difficult to get other issues right. And the significance of talking about soil depth you probably all seen a construction site or a subdivision where you know historically they'd go in and strip all the topsoil and put down a layer of sod and you know you just keep pouring the water on. Well, if you think in terms of the fact that about half of our water supply goes into watering your gardens, that's a huge implication if you have a reasonable soil depth because you know it's a sponge. So if you have the sponge. It helps you achieve sustainability supply. It starts with every piece of property. The other side of the equation is drainage. In terms of how water comes off the land, if you strip the soil off and you pour the water on, that's one thing in the summertime, but when it's raining in our climate, it's coming off. What does water coming off the land do? Well, it erodes, streams, it impacts on the sustainability of aquatic habitat. So, soil, soil depth, how much soil you have in your piece of property, it's a cornerstone or a foundation block of how we get towards water sustainability. So keep that in mind. I want to introduce, introduce an equation to you, which is out equals in, water out equals water in. And uh, this is about five years ago that we created this particular graphic as part of education and outreach and informing practitioners, because people tend to make things very complicated. And you know, it's so, it's so deceptively simple when you say, well, water up, equals water in, great. Um, but if you think of it from, from an engineering background or your mathematical background, how do you solve an equation?
equation, which is variable on both sides. Think about it, right? And, that, and that's, that's the significance, because if you start drilling into it a little bit more, I think that you probably can get this one, right? In terms of you know, the factors that are affecting you on the inside, in terms of hydrology and weather and timing, all the, all the points you, you address in your issue, on the outside, what's happening? Well, looking at it from a British Columbia perspective, and again, drawing on, on the almost 40 years of experience, what's really changed for us is the safety factor has been shrinking over time. Because we've always been vulnerable in British Columbia. And it's the nature of our supplies here. If you think about most communities in British Columbia, and the way, you know, we all live in the valley bottoms, and there's always these small mountain streams, which are our source of supply, and they all tend to be seasonal, right? So uh, we've always had issues. What's really aggravated things in the last 10 or so years is the fact that it's one thing if you have a small population relative to a big supply, you can have upsets in the system or variability, you don't notice it. But now your population grows, and it's, and it's relatively speaking, it's a big population relative to a smaller supply, doesn't take much of a perturbation, perturbation? How do you say it anyway, right? Anyway, variation in the system. And so that's what's really got us thinking about the significance of soil depth, right? How we can manage things differently in terms of how much water we use and then how much water is coming off the land and when it comes off. So all these things start to come into play here. And really, a phrase we have been using in recent years is it's all about water for life and livelihoods. So again, it's a very simple equation. It's the water balance with a, a lot built into it. But that's the fundamental building block that starts getting you understanding the more complex issues. So again, my role is that of local government. And collaboration is the way we're beginning to make things happen. How many of you heard the expression design with nature? About the same as living water smart. That's, that's really great because a lot of people who are on the young, young side actually put their hands up because this is, this is uh, Ian McCarg wrote the book back in 68. So that's over, that's over 40 years ago. But it's, an exp it's, a, it's a statement or a, a way of thinking that we in British Columbia have embraced. So if you, if you read anything about the Water Sustainability Action Plan and the various partnerships, you will see that expression, a design with nature approach. So we're not fighting nature, but working with nature. And one of the things that we learned early in terms of how people respond to language is you got to really watch if your language is value laden. And so uh, one, of the, one of the things we did about five years ago was we basically translated Patrick Condon's eight principles into more user-friendly language where people, when they read about, okay, what does this mean to you? Here are the, here are the bullets, okay, develop, develop compact and complete communities. Well, you've all heard that, right? But it was as you move down the, down the, uh, the list, basically made it more engineering-centric. But in doing that, it became more neutral, and we find that people don't, well, what we, what we, what we found was, you may, some of you may be familiar a few years ago when Smart Growth published a document which basically uh, uh, said you should, everyone should live in high rises, not in, not in, not in, not in Chilliwack. And that antagonized a lot of people, which was a, which, which was a good example of why the choice of language is so important. Because if you want people to hear the message, and hopefully you hear my message, you want them to listen to the words and say, aha, I get it. You don't want them to push back. And what we have found is the use of design with nature, people just intuitively get it. And so when you talk about things like reusing and recycled water, energy, and nutrients from liquid wastes, they say, okay, that makes sense to me. Or protect and restore, protect and restore urban, uh, urban green space, yeah, that makes sense to me. And then, and then the next one that's really boring for Bill Reese, which is strive for a lighter hydrologic footprint. And that's the significance of soil depth and sustainability of supply and sustainability of aquatic habitat. Because if we strive for the lighter hydrologic footprint, then we will achieve higher levels of protection in terms of our watersheds. How, how's my time going, by the way? Well, you have three minutes left. Oh, I'm going fast. Go okay, I'll go fast. No more stories now. Great. Okay, because I want, to, I want to show you that you know that there is hope, and there's a lot happening on the ground in British Columbia, and we're putting a lot of efforts right now on Vancouver Island, and the significance of this graphic is in terms of the initiatives that are underway, grassroots, when I say grassroots, grassroots local government, in terms of you know the Comox Valley, their integrated approach to settlement, the, uh, the Nanaimo region, their, their, their action for water program, 
uh, the couch and basin water measurement plan uh, in, in the Victoria region, Beaufort Creek uh, blueprint, I'm going to talk about that. And of course, in um, Vancouver, the Metro Vancouver, our integrated liquid waste and resource management plan, in terms of Metro Vancouver, I am chair of the reference panel, which is an advisory group to the politicians. So there's a lot happening now in terms of interregional sharing, and people are changing things on the ground. I think 2020 will be a significant year when we look back in terms of what we're putting together, because now I know what's going to happen. Um, I just want to mention Boca Creek Blueprint because really this 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 is the the most significant example to come forward in British Columbia of a, of a, of a community, well, three communities, because three municipalities, having a vision for how they're going to systematically restore the, you know, the ecological functions in the urban heartland of Victoria. So you think Victoria, see Victoria, Oak Bay, and Sandwich, but it's a hundred year vision. Go to Water Bucket or go to Google and just um, Google uh, Boker Creek Forum. You can read all about it. But the reason it's, it's so significant, quote from my colleague Eric Bonham, we call it reclaiming lost territory. And the significance there is that, you know, we reflect back on our careers as engineers. There were a lot of things we did in the 70s and the 80s, not because we were bad, but we didn't think about things. You know, we just we, we reacted to problems in the creek bed, we solved the problems, we didn't think about what's happening in the landscape. But in the last 10 years, we think about what's on the landscape, and we are doing things differently. And so, what people did not consider important for the 60s and the 70s and 80s, is what we're trying to re restore now. So in terms of, 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 and they call it a blueprint for a very good reason, it's not a plan or a master plan or a watershed plan, it's pragmatic because because it is, you know, a long-term commitment. And as we said to them last week, because we had a forum to celebrate it, my God, you people have, you know, you've got the audacity to have a hundred-year vision and begin to mobilize people from the ground, bottom up and top down in terms of mobilizing the community. And they're acting upon this vision to systematically restore what the Victoria region looks like. And you know they're actually they've actually got brought together the municipalities, and it hasn't come because somebody's imposed it. Again, it's the coming together of bottom up the community, the key key advocates, and top down in terms of those who were in, involved in local government. All finished. So we call it, it's this new form of top down bottom up governance. They have a vision. There is community involvement. The support from the decision makers, and they're applying a design with nature approach, which is part of restoring the, the landscape. So as I reflect back on, on what I've observed in my career, this is how I summarize by saying why tier thinking is needed more than ever. Because I have seen time and time again how we create layers of complexity around assumptions. One of my rules of thumb is, if you take any kind of initiative, drill down, peel back, peel back the layers of the onion until you get back to the, the simple assumption so often tends to be flawed. <laughs> but then, just read really what that reminds you to do is ask a different question, you'll get a different answer. So you always keep in mind. I think more than ever, I've, I've been looking at the last decade or so, there's this, I would say there's this prevailing mindset that there's only one right answer. But you heard today from, you know, Bill, you know, person Buzz and, and, and with Bill is that, you know, things are unpredictable. And yet we seem to have lost sight of that. I think part of that may become because we've become so dependent on computers. They're great, but they don't replace judgment. And that's a key measure is, is the significance of judgment and people of goodwill and the things that you can make happen when you get around the table with a different you know, a group of people with different perspectives and interact and share. So I want to leave you with this message of hope. You mentioned the guidebook when you introduced me. Uh, uh, our, our mantra when, back in 2002, in terms of when that guidebook was developed, was build a vision, create a legacy. Looking long term, right, that's the vision. How do we get there? And this, this quotation, which Eric Bonham found in England, it's amazing how some things are timeless. A vision without a task is but a dream. A task without a vision is but drudgery. A vision with a task is the hope of the world. What it means is you've got to be grounded. That's it. 